Ayabuan. Welcome to the latest episode of Being Integrity. Now you notice I'm not sitting in the studio, I'm outside overlooking, well I can see pretty much the whole south end of the island from here. I want to have a personal talk, like face to face, chat. And this is the crux of the issue. I've wanted to have this chat with you since beginning the series. Actually, since beginning the whole uh, Skillful Living Network series. All the videos that we've done so far have led up to this conversation. So this is a very important episode, a very important conversation. And if you get it, if you understand what I'm about to say, it means you'll be able to transform your life radically into the kind of existence that you really want. And if you don't get it, well, you walk away from this with very little. So to increase your chances of getting it, I think a few episodes ago I advised you to go back and review our other series such as the Foundations series, Becoming Genius, Being in the World, and Call of the Friend. Now, if you haven't done that, I strongly advise you to stop the video now and go back and do it. Here's a link to our playlist page. And you can go back and review those videos because we've been building up to this conversation throughout the whole series from the beginning. You need to have a certain background, a certain ontology, a way of looking at life, a mindset, or however you want to describe it, a context that gives meaning to this conversation that is big enough to hold that meaning, to complete that meaning, to understand it, to duplicate it in your own mind because this is the most important conversation in the whole series it might even be the most important conversation in your life I'm serious so we've been studying the process of becoming taught by the Buddha dependent origination Paticca Samupada. And what I'm here to tell you is that every minute of every day, of every year of your whole life, you have been engaged in a process of becoming. Paticca Samupada is a natural law, a natural process, as natural as gravity, as natural as weather. No, it doesn't always come out the way you expect, but neither does the weather, does it? Still, it's lawful, it's natural, and it operates every minute of every day. Everywhere, for everyone. So it's the closest thing that we can come to an actual absolute truth. An actual universal law of life the law of karma. Now, the law of karma is equal to everyone. The rain falls on everybody. It even falls on the ocean. So, everybody gets wet. <laughs> Similarly, everybody gets karma according to their previous actions. And this is how their being is shaped. This is how their being is determined by the fabrications, by the consciousness, and by the kama. Buddha said there are three factors in becoming. Kama is the field. Consciousness is the seed. And desire is the water, the moisture, the nutrient. All three must be there for becoming to take place. Now, 
When we say that the chief quality of a person of integrity is to reduce or eliminate suffering, a lot of people will say, well, I do that. I try to reduce suffering. Huh? That bottle of scotch I drank last night was to reduce my suffering. That heroin that I shot up last week was to reduce my suffering. Huh? That, that guy that I uh, aced out of a job at work was to reduce my suffering. So I'm reducing suffering, see? No. <laughs> no, we don't accept that. Because that kind of comma, that kind of activity may reduce your suffering or the suffering of a few people around you. Hey, I, I gave to, uh, to Goodwill. Huh? I go on the, the internet and that micro lending site and I, I give $10 sometimes to some guy in Uganda who's raising coffee. I'm reducing suffering, right? No, wrong. Because if you use a method of reducing suffering that does not ultimately eliminate suffering completely, all you're doing is postponing it. It's like the difference between paying cash or credit card. You're going to have to pay the credit card eventually, plus interest. So if you do something that reduces your suffering now, at the, pro, at the cost of increasing it in the future, what have you done? You have simply mortgaged your future to pay for the present. Another point, the being that you have now, are you satisfied with it? Are you happy with it? Let me ask you in another way, are you free from suffering? No? Well, that means your being is not perfect. Your being is not ideal. Your being could stand some improvement. A real person of integrity has substantial relief from suffering to the point where they don't need intoxication. They don't need sex life. They don't need violence or stealing or cheating. That's why the Vinaya is there. That's why the precepts are there to measure whether a person's being is actually up to the standard of a person of integrity, a sapurisa. So if you're not up to that standard, then according to the Buddha, you don't have integrity and you're going to be involved in suffering. So you might say, well, I'm doing okay. You know, somehow I got through my childhood without being too crazy and I got through school without a uh, major disaster and now I'm working and maybe I'm dating somebody or I'm in a relationship and you know, I'm, I'm reasonably happy. <laughs> well, good. <laughs> but how long can you expect that to last? Seriously. Any happiness that you have through a process of conditioned being is only temporary. And it will fail. It will let you down. That girlfriend or boyfriend will betray you sooner or later. I mean, even in the best possible case, eventually either they're going to die or you're going to die. <laughs> and you're definitely going to die at the end. How do you deal with that? How do you handle that suffering? See, these things are called crucibles, existential crises, and they happen to everybody. So you may be sailing along now and doing okay, getting by, getting through the day or the week or reasonably uh, okay without too much damage. But at some point, Something is going to break down. I guarantee it. I absolutely guarantee it. And you might say, well, I'm smart enough to deal with that. And so, in answer to that, 
I want to tell you about something called the curse of the talented, the curse of the intelligent. The curse of the intelligent is as long as things go fairly according to plan, fairly normally, fairly smoothly, you can get by by using your natural talent and intelligence. But at some point, there is going to come a day when multiple things go wrong. You may be able to deal with one thing going wrong or two things going wrong, but when three or four or five things go wrong all at the same time, nobody can deal with it. It's beyond your natural ability. You need some method to approach this problem because at that point you're going to want to change your being. Now this is how it works. If you watched our video on the root sequence, which I sure hope you did, <laughs> the root sequence describes how we create our I, how we create our identity, how we create our self. And when that self is born, other people see us as that self. And then we go through life until one day something happens that invalidates that identity, that breaks that the premise on which that ego is based, that destroys that I. And then we feel death. <clears throat> we feel the cessation of that particular identity. And so what most of us do is that we stop feeding that identity and we go and create a new one. So that's fine as long as it's just one thing going wrong, as long as it's just one problem invalidating that identity. But what happens when simultaneous things go wrong all over the map? The whole board lights up red. What do we do? Maybe you've escaped it so far and you've been able to get by on your natural ability, your intelligence and your talent. Well, congratulations, that's great. But mark my words, there's going to come a day when you have existential crisis, when you're thrown into the cauldron, into the frying pan. And if you try to get out of it by creating yet another new being on the same premise, it's just like going from the frying pan into the fire. You're going to find yourself in serious, serious trouble with no way out. I'm going to tell you my story, how I got this knowledge. I was a senior disciple of a very famous spiritual teacher in India. And I had even become a guru. And I had ashrams and disciples and followers all over the world. But slowly, I began to develop doubts. The deeper I researched into my tradition, the more it seemed like it was just a fabrication. It was just imagination. It was just a visualization based on nothing. This reached a climax where all of a sudden it was revealed to me that my guru, my spiritual master, had actually sold out all of his disciples and his entire organization to, let's say, an outside agency, if you follow my drift. So the success that we all attributed to his following strictly some ancient teaching that was somehow approved by God <laughs> evaporated. And the raw fact of the matter came out that he had backing, he had secret money coming in from very high sources. This was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back for me. And I was feeling a lot of anxiety because of my doubts and because of this new information coming out very confidentially. It still isn't public. 
So I felt that I had to quit being guru. I had to leave my disciples to to do whatever they felt uh, was necessary. And I had to pretty much wipe the sake, slate clean and start all over again, figure out what is the meaning of life and the whole thing. Another way to say it is, my board went red. <laughs> Everything lit up with problems. There was no easy way out. In fact, there was no way out at all. That's how it appeared at the time, anyway. There was no way out of that situation with the being that I had, that I had worked 40, almost 50 years, really, to create. That being was finished. That being was dead. It was the end of the road. And so I went off on my own. And I tried very hard to start a new being. But it was more or less based on the same principles. And it failed. It failed again and again. And finally, I said, OK, I am going to have to research my core understandings of life in order to understand what went wrong and how I can fix it. So I started looking into everything, integrity, leadership, ontology, philosophy, existentialism, all things that my instinct told me had some bearing on the situation. And after more than a year of intensive research, and I'm talking about sweating it, my life was on the line. My reason for being was up for grabs. Was I going to go back to being an ordinary person? Was I going to uh, join another spiritual group? Was I going to just become an atheist or an agnostic? Uh, was I going to change my identity? Was I going to start my life all over again? What was I going to do? And I was 64 years old when this happened. So I think a lot of people would have just quit, maybe even committed suicide. It was that bad. It was really bad. It felt like dying every day for months until I started to get a handle on what was wrong. And what was wrong was a lack of integrity. A lack of integrity in my teachers, a lack of integrity in the society, a lack of integrity in myself, a lack of integrity in my followers, in the scriptures that we followed, in the process we were trying to implement, and so on and so on and so forth. Lack of integrity. Well, okay, that was the cause, but then what's the cure? So I started researching further. And long story short, I found myself substantially in agreement with the teaching of the Buddha. So I went to Thailand to learn Buddhism, to learn meditation specifically. And within a few weeks of trying the Buddha's methods, I was substantially, profoundly relieved from my suffering. Well, why? Because I started to implement this practice based on Paticca Samuppada, the process of becoming, to create a different type of being, a being with integrity engineered in from the start. So this would not have happened if I had not been dumped into this crisis. And if we look at the stories of many prominent people, people who have made tremendous contributions to human society or business or knowledge or even spiritual life, they all had this kind of a crisis, existential crisis. The Buddha did. The Buddha story, if you don't know, he was raised in fantastic opulence. Everything that he wanted, whatever he wanted, he got. He had tremendous, uh, not only material opulence, but the people around him were very intelligent, very advanced. But he was shielded from all suffering. He had no idea how most of us live. 
And one day he went out with his chariot driver and said, I want to see what's out there. Look, show me around. And they went into the town. And he saw for the first time in his life, someone stricken by poverty, someone stricken by disease, old age and death. And the Buddha was moved by compassion. He said, this is going on? And the chariot driver said, yes, uh, everybody has to face these things. Even me, he said, yes, even you. So he went back deeply, profoundly uh, shaken to the core of his being. Everything he had experienced so far in life was called into question. It was a shattering experience for him. And he resolved, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fix this. I'm going <laughs> to solve this problem of suffering for everyone. What a great person. So he went, and you know the rest of the story, meditated in the forest and so on for six or seven years. And then he finally found the key to enlightenment. So what was that key? Four noble truths, and we've given you them already. There is suffering. There is a cause of suffering. There is cessation of suffering and a path to that cessation. We're trying to teach you this path. But first you have to acknowledge that you are suffering. We can't get to the fourth noble truth until you admit that the first one applies to you. And we've given a whole background, a whole series, actually several series of analysis of the human condition. And now we have shown the causality behind it the dependent origination, paticca samupada, the process of becoming. So the problem is, every one of us has been engaged in a process of becoming for our, our whole life, and now what we have got by that process is not at all satisfactory. We're suffering. So, that means we don't really understand the process or the cause of suffering. Because if we did, we'd be able to fix it. That's why we're going into Paticca Samuppada in so much detail and drilling it and drilling it. You should also watch our other videos on the same subject in the Paritta series. I'm going to put links to that on the bottom here that you have to understand not only that you can change your being, but how to change your being, and more than that, where, what you should change your being into. Otherwise, you're going to wind up right back in the same position again, suffering. If you do not start the process of becoming from knowledge. In other words, if you started from ignorance of the Four Noble Truths, you're going to wind up in suffering again and again. And there's no way out of it until you adopt the Buddha's knowledge and the Buddha's process. And the measure of how well you adopt that process is in the Vinaya, the principles or precepts of Buddhism. There are other measures, too, and we'll get into all that as we go on in the series. But you can see the way that you wound up being is more or less accidental. Your being is more or less a product of circumstances. The school has pushed you in a certain direction of being. Your parents have pushed you in a certain direction of being. The media. Uh, the sports, the culture, the music, everything around you has pushed you this way and that way according to their agendas, the politics, uh, the other students at school, the people you grew up with, the music of your generation, whatever it is, all contains semantic elements 
that when you absorb them into your name and form, uh, your process of fabrication, you create a type of being. And that type of being creates a particular kind of suffering. So that's where you are. It doesn't matter whether you accept the norms of society or rebel against them. It doesn't matter whether you follow the program and the agenda uh, at school or at work or whether you're uh, against it. It doesn't matter whether your rebellion is open or covert. It doesn't matter whether you are rich or poor, fat or thin, or what you are. That being is conditioned, and that conditioned being is going to cause suffering. That's just the way it is. You think nature is wonderful and beautiful? <laughs> No, nature is a trap. Nature is a machine based on this process of becoming. And you can just as easily become a dog in your next life or become a worm or a snake as you can become a demigod. It just depends on how you play the system. If you engage with knowledge and determination, Remember, the three tra factors of becoming, karma and your consciousness and your desire. So if you use these things properly, if you use them well, you can substantially increase your quality of being in a relatively short amount of time. And over a longer amount of time, like when you change bodies, you can make tremendous strides in being. So, how you do that is dependent on your level of knowledge and your level of skill in controlling your mind, controlling your senses, and so forth. We're giving you all the tools to do this. Now, it's up to you to get the motivation together. And I'm suggesting that the best motivation is the knowledge that you are sooner or later going to face an existential crisis the cauldron of becoming, huh? the crucible of being. You're going to be put into a situation where you must change your being. Well, death is the universal one, it happens to everybody. But if you're more fortunate than that, you will be plunged into this existential crisis while you're still young enough and agile enough to really do something about it. If you wait until you're on your deathbed, I think you're going to blow it. It's too late. You've already pretty much signed up for your next embodiment. And you're going to have to ride that one through to the end. So this is the attitude of someone who has been a meditator, lifelong, sadhaka, and practicing sadhu in the Buddha's Sangha, that, okay, the karma for this body is already pretty much determined. There's not a whole lot we can do to change that. I can't change this body into, a, let's say, a demigod body, a deva body. I have to wait until it's time to change this body. But there's a lot that I can do right now to prepare myself for a higher embodiment in the future or for even transcending embodiment entirely. This is all possible through the process of becoming, through the proper application of the Eightfold Path. So I, I hope you have a vision now of how this thing fits in your life and how you can utilize this process to gain unprecedented benefits. I mean, how can I tell you? I started going to spiritual teachers when I was about 20. No, maybe 18. I was reading. Then by 20, I was actually going. And I studied extensively and read widely. I got so many initiations into so many different types of meditation, and I practiced them all. And many of them, the ones that were uh, bona fide, 
I practiced until I got the result. And I'm still doing that. So I have been around the block with this spiritual stuff. Actually, you can't even call the process of the Buddha spiritual. It applies to everything. Uh, so I have the confidence from my, I'll admit, limited experience practicing the Buddha's method. But I'm so impressed with the results that I've got that I'm willing to take a stand on it, make a commitment to it, become a monk, and then teach others through these videos and encourage them to walk the same path. Because the results that you get, the results that I got, were unprecedented compared to the other spiritual methods. And remember, I was a disciple of a Vedic spiritual master for over 40 years. I went so deep into that teaching, I hit rock bottom. And I unearthed a fundamental fabrication at its root. And of course, the, the thing that was out of integrity about that was that they weren't saying it was a fabrication. They were saying it's the absolute truth. However, the Buddha, when someone asked him, is the Eightfold Noble Path a fabrication? He said, yes. See, the Buddha is honest. Yes, it's a fabrication. But it's a fabrication that leads to the end of fabrication. It's a process of becoming that leads to the end of becoming. Not that you become a slave on an eternal treadmill to some transcendent God in some faraway heaven in some other dimension or something like that. No. He's not trying to cheat you. He's telling you the truth. This is a fabrication. This Eightfold Path is a process of being, just like the one that got you into suffering. But this one leads out of suffering, and it leads to complete enlightenment and cessation of suffering. So that's what we're offering here. And I think if you actually try this method, and we're going to go into the actual mechanics, the specifics of the method in the following episodes, okay? So if you get what we're talking about here, and you try this method, I think you'll be convinced very quickly that we're on to something. <laughs> so uh, please think this over carefully. Maybe review the video several times. Contemplate it and think about it. The being that you have got is more or less the product of circumstances. You were thrown into this world and had to deal with it. You've done okay so far, but you can do lots and lots better. And sooner or later, you're going to hit a rough patch, whether it's at the time of death or before, that is going to force you to have to change your being. And how are you going to do that? Are you going to use the same old slapdash method that got you into trouble in the first place? Or are you going to take the time now to learn the Buddha's path and have a chance to get completely free from suffering forever? Thank you.